Hello everyone, welcome to today's show. And if you are joining for the first time, this is part of our industry series for which we meet every Tuesday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. We review one vendor or the solution. Today, we are going to be reviewing a um, solution called Aptine uh, Made to Manage and they used to be called Made to Manage before Aptine acquired them. So now they are Aptine Made to Manage. So we are going to have a lot of fun discussing that. Before we do that, we are going to start with uh, everybody's intros. If you don't know me, Sam Gupta, principal at Elevate IQ. Elevate IQ is the independent ERP and digital transformation consulting firm. On that note, I am going to move to Andy for his intro. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me, Sam. My name is Andy Pratico. I've been involved in ERP software for small to mid-sized manufacturers all my life. And uh, I've worked all over North America, and uh, I've got a very strong familiarity with the Aptian Made to Manage product, so it should be a, a fun, fun episode. Yeah, and I am definitely curious to hear those stories, so we are going to have a lot of fun. Thank you so much, Andy, for being here. If you are in the audience and joining for the first time, make sure you guys post your questions and comments. We typically try to cover them during the show. If we run out of time, we'll make sure that you receive your answers. On that note, Andy, I am going to start with the quick brief in terms of my understanding of the solution, where would they sort of fit in the value chain. We are also going to review the corporate strategy for AppChain. I guess we have done, I don't know how many episodes that we have done for Quite a App, few. AppChain. Quite a few, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, there's more. They have more that we haven't just done, but the list goes on for a long ways. Exactly. I think they I probably... Yeah, they probably have the similar number of products as, uh, you know, in four Apicor. Apicor has a lot. They have a lot of yeah, yeah, they do, but they don't, they really don't push many of them. Whereas Aptian tries to push them all at, at one time or another, it seems. So Apicor has a very different, in fact, I mean, see, you should have been in the last session, to be honest, when we reviewed this track. Okay, oh. so Apicor is not pushing. Their products are so unique. In some cases, uh, Apicor, right. I'm talking about track, Apicor. For example, right. <laughs> that customers are actually pushing them. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's very interesting the way Apicor has acquired Aptine. And so I'm actually going to review the, the corporate strategy for Aptine, right? And their corporate strategy is very unique as well. The way they are growing, in fact, they have had a recent event. And Andy, I don't know if you followed that or not. They were with Vista Equity, that, that is the private equity company. Obviously, they are humongous. I believe they are from, they are a Swedish company. So from Sweden, okay. Um, they have a lot of different companies in their portfolio. They had Aptine, I believe, for 10 years. Uh, and I think they got Aptine when Aptine was really struggling financially. So they sort of overhauled Aptine significantly. But 10 years is a very long time in general for any company, especially when you are talking about private equity world, they yeah. are quick cash out guys. Uh, you know, five years. Well, usually, probably... usually. I mean, yeah. back when they first purchased, you know, back in the 1990s when Battery Ventures first purchased Made to Manage, yeah, they hung on to it for a, quite a while. Yeah, but but usually you're right. It's usually a, a try to flip. Exactly. And honestly speaking, I think there is a little change in the Vista equity strategy as well. They are doing a lot of shuffling and we have seen the shuffling with the, some of the other products as well. So mm -hmm. in this particular case now, Vista got out. So obviously there are going to be changes overall, uh, you know, in how Aptin is going to be positioning themselves. Because now the new private equity, what they are going to be doing, they are going to be looking at the next phase of growth for Aptin, which is going to be very different now. Let's review what they had done, let's say, in the last 10 years. So their primary strategy has been coming from some regions in, in Europe. Okay, Europe has been their major region, which is kind of shocking because 
Europe is already very crowded in general with the ERP systems. You know, very I mean, crowded. My understanding of Europe market was by default, everybody would go to SAP, right? I mean, there is no competition there. Uh, you know, that was my understanding of the European market. But in fact, I mean, the European market has become far more competitive than the US market at this point of time. You have uh, your SAPs of the world, you have IFS, um, you have Unit 4, Aptine is doing very well, Acumatica is trying to penetrate. So, so overall, I think Europe market is getting a lot more competition. So what these guys had done, these guys had actually targeted very specific patches and Europe also has different regions uh, inside Europe and they sort of work in tandem, uh, you know, the way these markets work. So for example, if you talk about DAC market uh, and that is going to be your um, uh, Deutschland, I guess, ne Netherlands, uh, you know, Austria, Hungary uh, and uh, what else am I missing here? And check as well, right? So, so those four, I guess, you know, they go together. Uh, and deck market in general is very, very, very unique. It's a fast growing market. So they have acquired a lot of different companies uh, in that market. Now, overall, from the Aptin perspective, they were targeting these micro geos the way uh, Apicor likes to. They like to go after the trade groups, buying groups. That's how Apicor works, right? Apicor is primarily, in my mind, they are very North American company in general. Uh, Aptine has a very different approach. They're not they, what? what did you say there, Sam? They're not uh, what? Apicor is primarily a North American company is what I was trying to say, okay? Right. And Apicor, the way they like to work is they like to go after the specific trade groups or yes. buying groups. What inside a great the strategy. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And that's how Apicor likes to promote their products. They are so deep. They are integrated so deep inside these buying groups that none of the other products are going to work the way Apicor products are going to work. So that's their strategy. Now, if you look at Aptine, Aptine is very interesting, right? So what they like to think is, you know what, if you go outside of your developed countries market, so this is going to be very small countries, okay? In that, what are your options, okay? You are either going to get mom and pop or you are going to get those vanilla ERPs, which is going to be SAP, Microsoft, uh, typically. And then you have to do a lot of development. Cispro is a South African company. I mean, they probably, in general, you know, I don't know how much penetration they have in the other markets, to be honest. Sure, North America, obviously, they are very well known. There's no question about that. But overall, if you look at their documentation, that's going to feel very South African in general. No question. But they do have a strong presence in the UK as well. Right. But I mean, UK and Europe is obviously very different, right? I mean, there's water <laughs> between them. What's that? Sorry? <laughs> there's water between the UK and I know, Europe. I know, I know, I know, I know. And if you go to the UK, I guess, you know, those people are going to say, okay, this is not Europe or Europe is going to say, uh, you know, it's, it's always fun there, right? So yeah. UK is great. I mean, you know, but uh, it, Europe market is very different overall oh, from the ERP I perspective, agree. I agree. right? Um, yeah. So yeah, so unless you are talking about those major five market, right, there are not a lot of options in the market. So, for example, let's say if you talk about, in fact, I mean, Australia is very strong in Europe. Yeah, because that's an European company. It's not supposed I to know. be North American company. <laughs> <laughs> but Odu, in general, I mean, Odu, uh, honestly speaking, in my mind, it's uh, it's more of the accounting software. Okay, they are really strong sure. in accounting. Uh, you know, they yeah. have a little. Yeah, yeah. So that's why I mean, they are probably localized and globalized in roughly five, fifty-five countries. Okay, so they have very similar wow. strategy. Yeah, as NetSuite, uh, especially in the cloud. Uh, mm -hmm. NetSuite is, is very well localized and globalized as well. Uh, but the operational functionality is not going to be as robust as you are going to find in some of the other solutions. Oh, so yeah, Off the shelf, correct. Exactly, exactly. So Aptine, you know, their target market has always been food and beverage, uh, you know, as well as the process manufacturing industries. Uh, you know, the food and beverage, direct to consumer is always their primary target market in general the way they like to think, the way their acquisitions are, okay? So, made to manage is sort of our ball in their portfolio, to be honest. Okay, I don't know why they have this great manufacturing product. In my mind, when I look at Aptine, I'm always thinking, you are food manufacturing shop, you are a process manufacturing shop, why are you doing this great manufacturing? If your strategy is really going after all of those micro verticals, sure. You're talking like, about DCOM, is that right? Uh, DCOM is with ECI. Okay? Oh, I got it mixed up. I'm sorry. You're right. Yeah, DCOM is with ECI. Aptine has a lot of different 
process manufacturing, food and beverage, as really? well as a lot of retail products. Wow. That's what Aptine is really good at. For example, if hmm. you look at and Aptine has done the similar thing overall from the company perspective. It's a very similar strategy as, as in four, where they are trying to integrate a lot of different products together. Okay. They have an ITAS and they are trying to integrate all of them. Uh, from the financial perspective, financial guys got in the room and they said that, you know what, I am going to create really integrated company. That's what Aptine has done. But their bread and butter has always been uh, in that food, chemical, process-centric industries. If you look at the number of product lines they have this, this, for these markets, you are going to look at Process Pro, Produce Pro, okay, and they have a lot of different oh, add-ons. Oh, Aptine products, are they? Yeah. They oh, are all well, sure. That Process Pro has been around forever. Yeah, so Process Pro, uh, you know, Aptine Ross uh, is Aptine, Aptine product as well. Oh, Rob uh, Ross is as well. Oh, yeah. Well. I, I get it now. Yeah. And uh, uh, they, and by the way, Aptine is a very interesting company in general. Okay. So the way Epic uh, in four is trying to approach the market, they are trying to get rid of all of those point capabilities because they want to go as the full suite solution. That's what Epic in four is trying to do. And that's why they got rid of the EAM, which is probably was one of the most successful product for in four, right? Uh, but Aptine is different right now. Okay. So what Aptine is trying to do, they are still buying the pointed apps. Okay. And they like to promote that you don't have to buy everything. You can just buy one thing right now if you don't need everything. So their strategy is slightly different. So they have a lot of different add-ons that sits on top of your Microsoft Dynamics 365 Business Central. Okay. For example, just food. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a little, uh, you know, correlation and synergy there, um, to be honest, okay? But again, uh, way to manage, the way I like to look about this product is it's going to be very, very, very similar to the way Infor products are, okay? So obviously, they are trying to catch up with Infor overall from the strategy perspective. Uh, you know, that's their, their target market. Uh, and the products, even the products, they are going to appear very similar to Infor, the only difference really is going to be Aptine is targeted for much smaller organizations than your Apicors and Enforce of the world. So that's the real difference between what Aptine is trying to do versus what uh, Infor and Apicor is trying to do overall uh, from the corporate strategy perspective. So made to manage is going to be for much smaller customers in general. Uh, you know, the kind of capabilities that it is going to have, it's really targeted for those smaller customers. It's not really targeted for very large customers. And now, Andy, I'm pretty sure you're probably going to be asking me, okay, tell me the numbers. <laughs> and I probably don't have a very good answer for you. Okay. Which numbers do you do not have the answers for? Uh, the target market. So you're looking at, okay, is it 100 million? Is it 50 oh, million? Oh, oh. <laughs> you know, Made, made to Manage has been around for so long. Uh, most of their, I mean, they don't, they occasionally are uh you know pushing that product still but mostly it's maintaining their customer base and I, and i and if i was to guess i would can't imagine there's more than a couple thousand even though it's been around since 1980s right the number of customers are probably going to be not as many but right. if you look at right. the size of the customers that is probably going to be relatively smaller as well uh you know i don't think it will work for more than let's say if you are more than $100 million revenue. Oh, no. no. Yeah. Well, back in the 80s, 90s, I'll guarantee they were positioning for that size of company, but not anymore. Exactly. Exactly. So any other comments, Andy, before we start these slides? No, we can, let's have okay. a look. Okay. Um, so here is some history overall from the M2M perspective. So it used to be called Consona you know, Corporation. Uh, you know, M2M Holdings was the name of the company. Uh, and um, Overall, I mean, it's a, one of the things that you're going to notice with uh, this product is, you know, it's the core manufacturing product. There are a lot of products in the market that are trying to pretend uh, as the manufacturing product. For example, even if you look at NetSuite and Apicor, even Apicor tries to claim that they are the manufacturing product. But when I look at the data model, uh, right. it's just not there, to be honest, okay? But one of the things that I personally like about Made to Manage, it's really designed for manufacturing you will see the way the pro product is architected. It has very similar feel as your in four products because that's only for manufacturing. Uh, manufacturing as well as discrete manufacturing. The, yeah, um, yeah. Yes. I, yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah. I understand. 
Um, so but not other industries is what I meant. No, yeah. no, no. So discrete manufacturing in general is very, very, very different ND. Okay, the way they like to see their bombs and data model, to be honest. Okay, when you are going to be mixing it with, let's say, other assembly shops, uh, you know, it becomes all over the place. Typically, if you look, you are looking at pure play, uh, you know, CAD based manufacturing where you are going to go through multiple life you know, sub assemblies as part of your bombs, and that bomb actually comes to your ERP. Uh, those kind of processes, in my mind, are, are very discrete centric manufacturing, and they typically have very different layout uh, of the product. And that's what you're probably going to notice in this product as well. Now, uh, you know, some more history here. Overall, I guess, you know, you did mention this background about battery vent venture. So they obviously had them. Uh, but not anymore. Uh, they acquired a lot of different uh, companies in their journey, and that's how they grew the whole made-to-manage uh, offering. Initially, everybody sort of starts as more of a very thin slice uh, of the whole ERP suites, and then everybody's sort of trying to figure out, okay, how can we integrate? Uh, because the siloed experience is not going to work, right? So that's how these guys grew as well. They acquired a lot of different capabilities, and then finally they created a an ERP system. Uh, okay, so I don't have anything else on this slide. Well, it's interesting because if you look at that list of products, I mean, the intuitive product is really an MRP system, repetitive product based, the same thing over and over again. Ver, uh, DTR is for plastics, but in complex and relevant. When they were at their peak, they were yeah. very substantial project management ERP systems. Very interesting. Okay, so, and you are saying that they may have acquired these things because... The diversity get, of the functionality. To, to, to get the mixed, mixed mode manufacturing capabilities, I guess, right? So initially, they probably were doing just the, yeah. I don't know, maybe make to order, and then they had to get uh, the other capabilities as well because obviously they were trying to compete with companies like Infor. Um, for manufacturing. Well, when Intuitive first came out in 1996 or so, um, it it had a, a well. It was it was originally a, 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 its own independent company, and they were in in Redmond, Washington, right next to Microsoft. So that was their huh. big that was their big marketing push. But then uh, Intuitive tried to expand into more uh, custom and uh, ETO type manufacturers, and yep. really failed. Huh. So that's kind of what they brought on in complex and the relevant actually very interesting background um any 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 other comments on this these products andy no no there's sure a lot of them yeah yeah um okay so here is the look and feel <laughs> andy if i gave you this and i didn't tell you okay which product this is probably you are going to guess that this is probably in four to be honest <laughs> even the colors are same <laughs> yeah, <well. laughs> <laughs> it's, it's it's a pretty common looking screen. Yeah, and this is where you know I don't understand because you know their products are sort of painted blue, which is probably in four products color. Yeah, uh, yeah. you know, but their branding is yellow. So you know, I don't know how to read. Oh, is this, that right? Eh? <laughs> yeah, I mean that's oh. what I, most of these private equity companies. That's what see if you look at any of the companies in Vista Equity portfolio, they are all going to paint them yellow. Uh, that's Maybe a first thing. would look too washed out on the screen. I don't know. I don't know. But this is very interesting. I mean, see, even the colors are matching within four. The way Infor products are designed. Very similar, so, yeah. Yeah. So maybe they hired the same people from Infor, and I'm pretty sure there is a lot of movement in general because obviously they are very similar companies in general. Well, I'm colorblind, so I really can't give you a lot of opinion. <laughs> Andy, Andy. Um, so okay, so you cannot see that, right? Oh no, um, I can see it. <laughs> I think it's blue. I'm not sure, but I, I'll, I'll take your word. Yeah, which blue is that? I guess that's where. Okay, that's so my problem. Which blue okay. is it? Yeah. <laughs> okay, closer to blue. In four blue uh, In is what we. <laughs> <laughs> almost like your your logo color, almost isn't it? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Now they are trying to copy Elevate IQ. Probably that's Elevate what it IQ is. is see, yeah, yeah, that's the, <laughs> that's got to be what it is. Yeah. Uh, all right, guys. Um, so here, uh, you know, some of the very interesting things that I like about um, any of the manufacturing products, to be honest, especially when you look at the discrete manufacturing products, in my mind, when I'm looking at any of the discrete manufacturing products, one of the most flexibility that I would 
like to have is going to be, okay, how much capabilities are you going to have in the bomb manipulation? Okay, that's where the real play is in my mind. Especially if you're talking about really, really uh, deep shops, discrete manufacturing shops that are going to have multiple multiple layers of bombs. Complex, so how flexible, no. how easy yeah. it is going to be for you to be able to manipulate the bomb. That's where the real play is of discrete manufacturing. And that's where I... Uh, I think Mid to Manage has done a wonderful job, even though it's a very clunky technology in general, right? The technology is not, not new. It's legacy. You can see the screens. They are not relatively new. Now, Andy, the interesting part that I uh, like about these products is if you look at some of the ECI products and we have reviewed ECI M1. Now, ECI M1 had a very different feel because they were targeted for job shops and they don't necessarily consider themselves as <laughs> discrete manufacturing for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> but they like to connect and relate with different breed of products than how these products are designed. And in my mind, this is very discrete manufacturing. If you are going to have very deep engineered bombs, you probably want this. So this is manufacturing product for me. If I were running the manufacturing company, then I would like to see my products structured this way in my mind. This is the easiest to follow in general. From the so manufacturing you, so you perspective. you think that the M1 product is not really designed for complex builds? M1 has a crazy layout. You know, one of the things that you're going to find, let's say you have people who have worked on five different ERP systems and you yeah. are trying to hire them, right? Now, they are going to get a crazy shock. Now, if you have people who are coming from ECI M1, which is probably going to be a rarity, okay? But Once in general... The familiarity... Sure, makes sense. Exactly. And then that's where, you know, it's 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 a lot bigger issue than just how it is designed because this is your change management. This is your training issue. How people are going to be perceiving the product. And Andy, I was telling you this, okay? I have sat in a lot of different demos. And even after 20 years, I get confused. Okay, what is happening? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so ERP systems are that complex. So you are going to get some something completely new. It's very hard for people to be able to connect and relate with it. Uh, but I like over that the technology is very clunky overall, uh, you know, from the made to manage perspective, but the layout is very friendly. So one of the things that you're going to notice that you are probably not going to find even in more complex products. So here, what they are trying to do is they have provided a view to be able to compare many different bonds. Okay. You sort of have the comparison screen, but you can't have the same comparison that you are going to find when you are comparing, let's say the feature list of a product. Okay. In the e-commerce world. Okay, so here, the screen that you are seeing, here you are comparing every single bomb, their revisions, and you are looking at the individual attributes. In my mind, this is a phenomenal experience. I don't think even the larger manufacturing products can match this. So I absolutely love this experience, what Made to Manage has done, but I don't know how easy it is going to be for them to replicate this experience in the cloud world. Because now you have different technology. They don't work the same way you're spreadsheet or the .NET used to work. That's why they have this experience. But in the new world, it's going to be really hard to mimic this. Okay, so overall, I am a big fan of made to manage product because of the traceability, to be honest. Okay, it really has much superior traceability comparing to even some of the bigger products, for example, in four. Uh, in four is great, but it does not have as refined traceability the way you are going to find in the made to manage product in general so the product was designed well and again andy when you are going to be you know when i am talking about any of these smaller products i am typically mad about their design and architecture but in this <laughs> in this particular case i kind of like it okay right. the way it is designed okay so it's it's a very interesting product. Of the does it imply how far you can trace back, like come all the way to the raw material, or is it doesn't doesn't really say? Yeah. So from the operations perspective, it does provide uh, really good traceability from the manufacturing perspective. We are going to see in the reviews financial traceability is not as strong because uh, obviously, okay. yeah. Okay. So yeah. it's probably was it probably strong for medical device or something like that then. Well, so again, depending upon who is looking at the traceability and who, what are they trying to debug is going to be a question. So for example, let's say if a CFO is looking at a product, they are probably going to appreciate your yeah. SAP, Sage, uh, you know, NetSuite. Of the trails. 
exactly exactly because their issues are very complex when you are looking at very global organizations but yeah. let's say if a operation guy you know these these are going to be the guys who are operating on the bombs so typically these are going to be either material managers uh, you know the operations managers uh, or the shop floor managers those are the people who are going to be looking at the costing probably your some of the engineers as well estimators probably they are the ones who are going to be looking at okay what is the cost i mean where can i find my cost of the material and if my cost is going to be higher for a specific material how can i debug okay what is impacting this cost so now you are looking at all of the layers of assembly you are looking at all of those overheads and unless, unless you are using a manufacturing product it gets really difficult to trace all of that <laughs> okay and even personally when i am debugging these things i struggle okay so i like the manufacturing traceability of this product but financial traceability makes it real easy to, to uh rec see the differences between different revs that's for sure exactly exactly so here and the, the traceability that you're looking at is going to be for the committed quantity okay so here oh, you okay, are, gotcha. you okay. are looking at you know if you have a part which are the jobs that this particular part uh, has been committed to now you are talking number one it has really robust commitment okay that's a big deal in general commitment they are sort of there but they are not there you know commitments are the functionality of commitment is not as great in general in manufacturing systems so here we are talking about okay let's say if you have 8000 products and you want to find out if 4000 are already committed to your jobs then how many are you producing so that's kind of analysis uh, we are looking at so that's in my mind it's really advanced so obviously i like made to manage for that mm -hmm. and you know this is going to be at the individual job level so you can get that traceability uh now this is the bomb structure when we reviewed your apicor <laughs> it was really hard for me to be able to relate with the bombs because the way i like to see my bomb says okay here is my operation these are the materials that go in the in the um uh, operation and you need to have that segmentation so now here obviously this is a very sophisticated bomb there are some things that you should notice number one is going to be you can notice one two three four and those are the layers of the sub assemblies that this particular system can process so now they have one two three four and i believe they have something called star so i don't know what that star means to be honest okay so maybe they can do but for the most part i believe this product is going to be good for up to four five six they might claim in the marketing you can do 20 but you know the if you look at the optimum stage of the product probably you are looking at three to four uh, you know that's where this particular product will do which well. is which is most companies it's you know not many of them go deeper than that but you know when you look at the mrp runs and the honestly speaking i've seen even apicor break when you are looking at really well, complex you're products. right I, yes you're right yep so well, obviously well, this you, product... know, you know you know this is an older technology originally back in the 1980s this was developed using cobalt which is very very fast Exactly. And in the back end, they might still be using COBOL. You might not see that. I don't know what they're using right now. Um, to be honest, there is there is a case that they a lot of systems, even Apicore systems, they in the back end, they are really clunky in general. Okay. Well, not I know they use SQL Server now. They've upgraded their databases. But they, it, it, the middleware could still be your, yeah, and I don't know if they are using, yeah. you know, mainframe with SQL Server. I don't know right, how that right, works, right. but yeah, they, these guys are doing something in the back end, and obviously they don't share, uh, you know, that information with anybody in the world, right? I mean, see, these right. companies are extremely silent uh, because obviously, you know, that's their architecture, I guess. Um, so you are never going to know, even if you ask them, even if you have NDA with them, they will never tell you. Even Epicor is never going to tell you uh, what their architecture is, you know, how they are enabling these cloud products, but obviously they are very clunky. You can guess, um, you know, if they expose their architecture, you know, then you would know how clunky it is in the back end. Uh, <laughs> but is it going to be a cloud product? Who? Uh, made to manage. Um, yeah, uh, I think Appin really? is trying to sell them. Yeah, most of the products, it's a very similar strategy. Okay. Um, yeah, 100%. Well, well, tenant or single tenant? uh from the demo uh yeah they are probably going to be multi-tenant and they are selling really? as cloud that's my wow they put yeah. a lot of money into it then um they are definitely uh, again they have very similar strategy as as your uh in mm. four. yeah mm -hmm. yeah um so they definitely have done similar things as in four and i don't know how these companies are trying to port these 
you know, code bases to cloud, uh, there's a little trick there in terms of, you know, how much you need to modernize. Uh, because obviously, if you are going to rewrite the whole application, then you are looking at billions and billions of dollars. And these products don't even have that large market share, to be honest, to invest that kind of money. Um, so obviously, they have to cut corners somewhere. So they have figured out a shortcut uh, in commercializing these products on, on cloud. Uh, and I'm not too sure how they are doing it, to be honest. But the feeling is going to be very clunky in general. Yeah. So here, one of the things that you are going to notice, Andy, is going to be, so here, when you look at the bomb, you know, it might appear very natural that, okay, you have the routings, you have the materials, you have some of the sub-assemblies as well. But if you pay attention, and I was trying to figure this out as well, okay? So if you pay attention, the material, they still don't have correlation with your routing. Correct. That's okay? how it was originally designed. So now, but what that means like it is... It does a little bit there. The routing is along with the bill of material. No, they are at the same level. If you're oh, the same level. Oh, so you, okay. Gotcha. Yeah, so, so you have the material, and each of the material could have their own routing as well. But those oh. materials are probably going to have the, the... Those are the sub-assemblies, uh, you know, but the routing and your material, you sort of don't have the correlation. So now, oh. even though I like the layout, but then this is very comparable to your Apicor. This is very comparable to your NetSuite. <laughs> what, what what are the color coding there on the second column on the left mean? Do you know? Second column, which one? The green ones? Green, yellow? There's, there's that... first column, they're all blank. Second column is all colors on the left. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that is very similar architecture as in four, where let's say if you are going to make any changes, then that is going to be unsaved change. And then you oh, go and, you know, okay. you hit the save. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's what mm -hmm. color coding means here. Oh, uh, okay. But, you know, so the overall design is fancy. It's designed from the perspective of a manufacturing person. But if you look at the data correlation, it's really weak. It's very comparable to your genius. Um, you know, genius has the same data structure. Apicor has the same data structure. NetSuite has the same data structure. The only company or the products that are going to have the correlation between your routing and material are probably going to be just the Infor products. That's what I have seen so far at least in most of the products that i have personally reviewed yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and i don't know how weak even with in four that correlation is going to be um you know so now i can see and i don't know if this is purely uh because of the performance reasons because if they are actually going to have that correlation i think mrp is going to take far longer because you have to maintain one more correlation mm. okay and it might break the whole system so there could be but i don't know Honestly speaking, I personally like to see that, but what are going to be the real implications if you don't have that correlation? I can see a lot of them, to be honest, uh, because from the operational flow perspective, if you don't know which material belongs to which operation, then you sort of don't know. You are giving them, okay, these are the seven materials. You have four steps. Now figure it out, guys. Right. <laughs> you know, uh, which material, but if you are looking at very regulated industries, when you are looking at lot controlled items, you need to know the specific item that is going to be used on the specific operation. So I can see some issues there. They might be faking it. <laughs> they might be pretending, uh, you know, in these verticals, but I can see a lot of issues uh, with these systems. Interesting. Now, uh, you know, they have done some very interesting things overall from the report perspective. So obviously this product was designed when you had the real paper, uh, you know, as you walk on the shop floor. Right. So here, you know, you can probably expand your sub-assemblies and the way your reports are going to be printing is uh, what you see is what you get. This is the experience, right? So here, if you are going to be expanding your routings, your report is probably going to be printing that. But again, even if you look at the reports, so here you are going to get correlation between your jobs and sub-jobs, which is mind-blowing, okay? For the size of the product, if you are getting your correlation between jobs and sub-jobs, that's great because you need that in a lot of different discrete manufacturing situations where, you know, otherwise you will not be able to schedule. So scheduling is really important. But the in my mind, I think if you look at the material planning and material control, that experience is going to be equally critical as well in a lot of verticals. Not every product can do that. Uh, the only products that I've seen so far, probably in four is the only product, uh, you know, that they, they, they can do that. Okay, so here some of the very interesting, uh, you know, correlations. Number one, if you talk about product classes, uh, when you talk about, uh, you know, parent group code. By the way, I mean, see, I want to clarify my comment there. 
you know, I think the bigger products are going to have the same correlation. For example, SAP most certainly has uh, those correlation when you talk about operation to your material. Uh, you know, Oracle, I would doubt because they are not really designed for manufacturing. Uh, you know, Microsoft may have that. They do decently well in the manufacturing space. Uh, I think I think finance and operations certainly does. Yeah, yeah, I I would agree with you there. Business Central is not a manufacturing product. There's no way in that. No, it's not. <laughs> but that's a whole other debate. <laughs> yeah, exactly, um, exactly. So here, uh, you know, we are talking about the product classes and group code. Now, I called out some of the products, and if you remember, uh, we saw product product classes and group code. If I remember correctly, yeah. I think we saw in the case of either M1. Or some of the the smaller job shop centric products, they had the product class and group code. So this seems to be very category centric information that you are going to see in your e-commerce. If you look at Apicor, Apicor actually keeps those categories that are going to be from the marketing perspective. Now these pro classes are very important the way some of the organizations operate. For example, let's say if we go in the tooling. Uh, you know, companies, the companies that are uh, producing either tools or tool parts, you know, Real something machine that goes. Uh, exactly, exactly. So for them, the classes are very important because the reason why classes are really important is because their whole sales process is actually driven by those classes and the group code. So they are going to get the pricing. And for them, it's always going to be, okay, uh, are you looking at Siemens machine? Are you looking at 3M machine? And typically this part is going to go in that. And then you are going to have, okay, 3M custom pants. So that's my sort of product group that I am trying anytime I'm going to get a part. So for them, this categorization and the grouping is very important. Okay, in that vertical. I don't know if the other verticals are going to have that. But interestingly enough, I have not seen this correlation with the larger products, product group and product class. This is available in, in food manufacturing space. Uh, you know, you have the product group and uh, food. Uh, what is that called? The recipe? Uh, item family. No, family oh. group family code. So their entire SNOP planning, they do it based on your item family. But discrete manufacturing, this is very interesting, to be honest. I mean, I have not seen this. Some companies use this. So this could be a process issue, the way they have been structured. Uh, but you know, overall, this is very interesting that even me to manage is doing it. Um, Okay, so this is where the comment about the layers of the subassembly. So obviously, it is designed for the smaller manufacturing products, which means you are probably not going to have, let's say, five, six, ten layers. Um, you probably want, uh, you know, three or four. By the way, Andy, I think, yeah, yeah, I'm actually going to touch one thing on your comment related to the number of layers. I think you should have seen this track product. Okay, the number of oh. layers that you have in the custom. Cabinet uh, yeah. space, to be honest. Oh my goodness! I mean, it's it's mind blowing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the bombs are so complex because they go through a different process. They utilize a tool called BIM. Okay, so uh, that is yeah. building information management, right? Yeah. So that's yeah. a very different tool than your CAD. And typically, they have a lot more moving parts in general. You know, because their products are very different the way they are structured. You should look at their bombs, to be honest. Okay. I'm uh, I'm, I'm gonna rewatch that session. Yeah, it's very interesting, uh, you know, and I never thought, I was thinking, you know, this track is probably going to have very similar appeal as your visual, uh, but no, 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 no. That's a very different product. <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, yeah. And targeted a different, completely different industry too. I exactly. And, and in that industry, it could be challenging to implement the Manila manufacturing product uh, or the distribution product, to be honest. So that's a very unique industry. Um, so yeah, so that's why Apicor is really continuing that. You cannot implement, let's say, Kinetic or Profit 21 in those spaces. It's very hard. Even Eclipse is very hard. Um, but what so, was that about Kinetic? You cannot implement these products in that space when you are talking about oh, uh, the kitchen distributors. The cabinet woodworking. Yeah. yeah, it's okay. hard. It's hard. You should watch that episode. Um, I will. Yeah. So here now. This is my, you know, complaint about this product. Okay, uh, as I have mentioned, that you don't have that correlation, and honestly speaking, I don't have enough information to comment how bad this is going to fire back. I like to see that correlation, just because if you are going to go for the bigger, you know, organizations, you have to have that control. 
if you don't have that, you lose that visibility. So I personally like to have that, but I've seen too many products, uh, you know, that do not have that correlation. And somehow these companies are using it. So things are working. It's just that you're not going to get uh, the insight or the transparency when you are talking about operational to material co correlation. Uh, this is the cost explosion view. And I am a big fan of this view, to be honest, Andy. Okay. You are not going to find this in even the bigger products. So here you are looking at every single material. What was the cost of that? You are looking at the standard cost, the actual cost. So you have the real traceability comparison. Okay. Now, if you would like to see, okay, let's say if you are using um, uh, WF201B is your product and you have the quantity of 10. Now you want to see whether operation 10 is taking more cost because obviously you have to add the labor on top of your material. You lose that transparency because that data integrity uh, is sort of not built as part of the product. So the only thing you're going to get, okay, these are your materials. What is the cost? But what is the correlation with the operation? You can get, okay, what is the combined uh, labor cost for that operation? But you will not be able to maintain the correlation between your operation as well as the material. Okay, so some comment and, you know, I was thinking that I will be getting a lot more positive reviews based on the product architecture. At least some people will appreciate this. Uh, that doesn't seem to be the case, especially when you look at the reviews and they are very different. So here, I think the review is coming from find a real ERP. Don't buy this gold plated doo doo. Okay. And I, th <laughs> <laughs> I think gold plated comment is coming from that yellow color. Of 15. So obviously they are very gold plated. There There's go. no question about that. But their products don't don't seem to be as gold plated, I guess. Uh, <laughs> um, so here, this company is 51 to 200, and my expectation was that this is probably the right fit for them. Okay, 51 to 200 employees, machinery. So let's review some of the problems that these guys have experienced. So they are saying it's a very old platform, and even when it was updated about seven years ago. So there has not been much of the development. Obviously, discrete manufacturing is not the target market for Aptin. So obviously, they are not investing a lot of money. They are carrying it because they have customers on it, so they don't have a choice. Right. Okay. Uh, now, th even though the screens are looking pretty, but they uh, felt that you know it is still felt like we were in the MS DOS world. And personally speaking, when I use Apicore products, I get the same feeling as if I'm using MS-DOS because, again, in the back end, you have the main frame. So even though they have figured out, OK, how to replicate that web experience in terms of providing those uh, you know, multiple tabs inside your browser, but when you are actually using it, you are not going to get the same experience that you would expect when you are going to use, let's say, Salesforce or HubSpot or any of the cloud native applications. So that's where the real difference is overall in terms of the experience. You might be okay once you get trained, once you get used to it, you're gonna feel, you know what, this is all great, no problem whatsoever. But that is the training. It might take six months to get used to of the product. Once you get used to it, then you might like it, if you, especially if you are using it on a daily basis, but you'll have a little learning curve there, uh, you know, because of the experience. It's not gonna be as intuitive. Uh, so here we are talking about, we requested that they have a warranty component. Okay, now let's get into the details. So they don't necessarily have that service component, the warranty component. So even though your manufacturing is going to be great, but if you are doing any sort of aftermarket, you probably will have a lot of challenges with this product. Okay, so this was designed for companies that are simply creating the product and shipping it. And then I don't know who's going to service. Uh, <laughs> but if you have to service as well, then you probably need warranty. So that's where I guess, you know, the complaint is coming from. Um, so here he's talking about uh, there was no warranty component in the system. So their credibility went out. They probably overcommitted that warranty is there. Maybe they felt that, you know what, you can implement warranty using custom fields, uh, you know. Or, or, or a work order or it's, something like that. Yeah, I mean, typically sales pitches are like that, right? But once that's, you... <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what they used to do with the visual product. Same thing is to turn, use a work order, but it's so clogy that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's really clunky. <laughs> Um, so, uh, now M2M does not have reporting well, so they are complaining about the reporting as well. Aptine report writer developed their own reporting function. So there's a sim similar, uh, you know, approach what, uh, your Infor is trying to do. Infor I has think they use, they use they, a lot of their customers use Crystal though. Who? Uh, made to manage customers. 
Ah, uh, so I don't know. I mean, maybe Appian changed their approach as well because obviously these vendors they don't want to be dependent upon SAP because SAP owns no. the report now. Exactly. So they are trying to decouple that and they are trying to develop their own. So they might be using Crystal and in, Infor used to use Crystal as well right. until you know SAP owned it now. Before SAP it turned into a competitor. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, here we are talking about okay for part sales M two M. Uh, is not a good. So basically, if you are in the aftermarket verticals, uh, you know, this is probably not a product for you. Then you are going to be doing a lot of, um, you know, field service and the repair uh, because warranty is not going to be there. Um, probably, the, probably for simple machine shops that really don't care about warranties and such. Well, so machine shops are probably not going to like this. You know, Andy, you know, they probably like something like Pro Shop because for them, what is most important is going to be the terminal, uh, you know, on the shop floor. That's and right. I don't know if Aptim really has the MES capabilities, and that's a very different architecture in general, to be honest. Okay, yeah. and that's where uh, some people like Apicore, to be honest. And the reason for that, even though you don't have data integrity, but a lot of those processes are going to reside inside MES. That's why MES Apicore does really well uh, in the manufacturing verticals. You know, the, the the product that I've seen that does the best at MES is Plex. You are right because it's MES, it's not ERP. I know. <laughs> if you talk to your ERP guys, all of us, they hate it. <laughs> I know. It's, it's an MES system. I exactly. Know. Yeah, I they know. put some accounting function there, but you know, and supply chain, but right. it's not designed to be um, the, the the core ERP. Yeah. So, yes, you are right. I mean, Plex has the best MES. There's no question about that. Uh, yeah, that's, that's why Rockwell actually bought it. Yeah. 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 Um, some more comments here. Uh, you know, I go back to the warranty segment of the program to help uh, track expenses. So obviously, they are complaining about finance. Finance is probably not going to be as strong with these products. Uh, the RMA flow, they are complaining about that as well. Again, anything that is going to be related to your B2B customer service, RMA return, warranty, market. it's going to struggle so much. Uh, don't, don't buy this for those segments. Um, here, we have a comment from 2020. So, which is not uh, very old. Uh, they are talking about worst support and implementation of any software I have dealt with in 20 plus years in IT. <coughs> <laughs> so, obviously, it seems like this person had the experience implementing some software. You know, that's how it sounds like. So, here we are looking at, again, very similar customer. Here we are talking about electrical electronics manufacturing, 51 to 200 employees. So, my mind is going to say this is probably going to be okay for their vertical. But they are saying, okay, support, complain about it. Okay, that's not a big deal. And I don't know which level of support you are on. So I'm not going to comment on that. But let's look at the product, okay? So they are saying support of their product. There should be no outsourced tech support. However, they have started doing that lately. Sure, everybody does that. Microsoft has outsourced as well. So I don't know where you are going to find a support. Again, work with consulting companies. They That is the only way you are going to find the right support, but obviously they are going to cost millions. Uh, <laughs> so get ready for higher bills. So here development team has no idea how to test a product or release patches in an effective manner. Uh, you know, upgrade was not until the 12th revision of the software. So uh, the whole release process, I guess Aptin is very new in the cloud as well, to be honest. So I don't know if this particular experience is coming because of their cloud. Uh, you know, migration. So most of the products that were trying to migrate to cloud, they all struggled with it. So maybe Aptin is struggling with that as well. And this is less than two years, all no, almost two years. Yeah, time. yeah. It's relatively newer. So I think Aptin is going through that process right now. Um, maybe their release process is not as streamlined, uh, but that's not good. I, I don't like it. Uh, now, 2017 M2M ERP unsolution. <laughs> Look at the comments. Okay, IT manager, Midwest, rubber services, and uh, you know supply company machinery, 51 to 200 employees. My understanding is going to be this is probably going to be you know okay vertical for them. So here we are talking about the management interface for users is not straightforward. And now if management is complaining about that, that's a real problem. And that's my problem with most of the manufacturing systems, especially if they are going to be focused on manufacturing, your management, finance, supply chain. Accounting function is going to be really weak in general. Uh, you know, the only thing that is going to be strong is going to be your manufacturing. If that is your critical success factor, then buy this product. Uh, managing permissions is probably going to be an issue that you are going to notice in every single manufacturing product. Uh, okay, it doesn't matter which vendor you are going with, you are probably going to uh, struggle with this, uh, any of the manufacturing products. Uh, it still has lots of issues that can cause 
significant downtime, that's really bad. Uh, why is ERP going down? I don't know. It should not be going down. Um, but I mean, this could be on prem as well. 2017, they might be using in that. So, you know, it could be your own data center, uh, not FTN. Uh, and the comment is I, I don't think it is, uh, it is less suited for anything outside of manufacturing. And typically, the business models are extremely complex in general. Okay, it's very rare to find somebody who's just doing manufacturing. <laughs> and these guys cannot even do aftermarket. So, which is very tricky overall. Uh, now, this is coming from the finance guy, machinery company, 51 to 200 employees. 2017, the reporting, so finance person is complaining about reporting as well. Uh, of made to manage is a bit of disappointment. We have purchased additional reporting software, and this is what companies typically do. They are going to utilize ERP, and then they have to get all of that data, jump into data warehouse, and they are investing millions and millions of dollars uh, in getting the, the reporting. And typically, that all is going to be built as part of the ERP if you're buying the right ERP software. Uh, some more comments here. So here we have 50 or fewer employees for mechanical industrial engineering. And in my mind, I think that is the right vertical as well. So ideally they should get five star, but here we have uh, 1.5 star, uh, but I don't care for those stars. What I really care for is the details. So here <laughs> they have a really funny comment. Okay, so M2M lends itself to great nicknames. Made to damage, okay? <laughs> Made to mangle, hard to <laughs> manage. That's crazy, guys. That's really crazy. Okay, so now the other comment. I think is, this guy's got a good sense of humor anyways. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree. There is zero uh, drill down functionality in the accounting package. Okay, mm -hmm. so this guy is complaining about that, and I don't know what is the title of this. This is 2017, here. though, so... Ah, I don't think you can build drill down and the. Uh, no way. Uh, okay. There's no way. Yeah. If the product does not support native linking, then it's very hard. Mm. Um, okay, so accounting is definitely a very big area in general for this product. Um, manufacturing traceability, I don't agree with this person, to be honest. Uh, I think it has really strong manufacturing and the operational and the costing traceability that you are probably not going to find in the other manufacturing products. Accounting traceability, I don't like any of the manufacturing products for that. Uh, right. You know, uh, Solid accounting functionality along with ERP tracking. So this, for some reason, he's saying accounting functionality is great, but traceability is not there. Now, I would suggest looking at other products. OK, if you're looking for solid accounting functionalities, obviously, this is not designed for accountants and accounting and the finance people. They will not like it. Uh, you cannot drill down from one screen to the next. Uh, all inquiries are reports instead of screen lookups. It takes a long time to analyze troubleshoot issues. I completely agree. This is probably going to be a nightmare. Uh, inventory management works well, but following the cost flow is cumbersome. I personally like the cost flow, to be honest. Mm, I don't know. Uh, seems like something is not working. Uh, so here, this is nine years ago. Uh, we are looking at new markets for diversification. Uh, so this is the company and a lot of manufacturing are looking Companies are looking for that. So if you're looking for diversification, you are probably going to be utilizing two different ERP, three different ERP. If you're acquiring companies with different business models, you are going to be looking at many different products. So again, if you're a diverse business, it's going to be really hard with these products. Um, when we purchased M2M in 2007, we were looking for a product where we wouldn't have to modify every screen report to get the information that they, the way we needed. Um, now, uh, yeah, overall, I think it's very strong. They have advanced scheduling the commitment. So very strong manufacturing product, but diverse business model, it's going to be really hard. Um, some more comment here. This is also from nine years ago. So I guess they they worked with a VAR in Canada and the VAR <laughs> ended up developing every single report when the reports were actually there, part of the wow. product. Can you believe this? <laughs> So this is crazy. Obviously, the bar was not as knowledgeable about the product. Uh, so they ended up developing. Well, they wanted to sell a lot of reports. Exactly. I mean, that could be it as well, right? <laughs> I mean, obviously, a lot of development dollars. I would love to develop reports as long as somebody else is paying for it. <laughs> um, OK, so I don't have anything else here. OK, so that's it for the session. Um, and the commentary insights. Well, it, you know, like I mentioned earlier, Made to Manage has been around since the 1980s. And back in those days, it was, uh, it was a very strong 
strong product. Its biggest limitation always was the fact that the bill material and the routing were in separate tables, which makes it difficult to really calculate promise dates and, and shop scheduling and things like that. But it had a very strong following and a lot of companies liked it. Now, whether or not it's it's still a competitive product, I think is debatable. But I know that Aptine is trying to uh, re-kick it off and get it back on the market as something to be considered again. So honestly speaking, Andy, and I don't know how the shop floor guys to think about scheduling in my mind they don't care for materials as much as they care for the they don't care tax. anything about materials exactly okay. and that's why these products were designed this way to be honest okay so you are right that well, they care less shouldn't say not nothing they care less about materials Typically, they take ad hoc steps on the shop floor. If material is going to be short, then they are running around, you know, figuring out, okay, what can I use? Can I use something yeah. else? I'm going to pick it. You know, so it's very can banish. Uh, I would say, you know, that's how the shop floors typically operate. But if you are looking for very structured scheduling where you need to really pr pr predict, okay, how much material are you going to be needing at each step? That's where the complications are going to be. So depending, yeah. so uh, I would say 80% of the manufacturing products that I've seen, they all don't have that correlation. They all claim it. Yeah, yeah. But, but if you need you need a you need very experienced eyes to notice the difference. Exactly. And by the way, see if MES is not going to support the material and the operation correlation, then even if you have as part of your ERP system, <laughs> doesn't matter. <laughs> so yeah. that could be the reason why nobody cares. I guess I don't know. I mean, it's very. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Um, so we have some comment and let's uh, look at these. So Anders is saying the column view is amazing, but I would imagine that customizing that data structure would be very difficult. And does it break down when comparing multi-level bombs? It seems like you could only show the top level characteristics. So Anders, I think the comment that I'm going to have is most of the manufacturing products that I have seen that provide this kind of view, they were designed for this experience. So I don't think you are probably going to have this issue and you can probably look at everything inside that bomb. It's not going to be just first level information. It's probably going to be everything because that's how, you know, the people who manipulate bombs, you know, that's how they like to see it. And if they don't have it, they're not going to like the product, uh, you know? So I don't think this is probably going to be an issue. The product was really designed for this experience, even though it's very small. Uh, so one more football. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is right. So right. I mean, we can make a lot of money if we promote ourselves as football uh, programmers. <laughs> um, Andy, final comments. I've already said mine, and I really appreciate you inviting me, Sam. Okay, amazing. So that's it for today. If you joined for the first time, this was part of our industry series for which we meet every Tuesday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. We review one vendor or the solution. So make sure you guys are going to be here next week. We are going to come back with another solution on that note. Thanks, everyone, for dialing in twice. Thanks, everybody.